Okay, good morning everyone. So today, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about what is mathematics. So, when, people, uh, when I tell people I have a PhD in pure mathematics, people often ask me, how do you do a PhD in pure mathematics? What new is there to discover in maths? Well, the answer to that latter question is there are an infinite number of things that one could learn new in mathematics. And in fact, mathematicians are constantly coming up with new and interesting concepts based on the observations they make around them. And they are constantly proving new and interesting facts about these concepts. And they are solving problems, making use of these concepts. So now I want to reset and rewind your, your view on what is mathematics, and in particular, what does a pure mathematician do? So a long time ago, someone came up with the idea of a number, and I'm sure all of you are very familiar with some basic numbers. But even today, people are doing research into things, properties, and questions relating to numbers. And there's a whole branch of mathematics called number theory, where people study such things. Then later, at some point, people came up with the idea of a shape. So on this slide, we have a circle and a square. But the question one might ask is, what really makes a circle a circle? What really makes a square a square? So if we look at this uh, square, first of all, one observation one could make is that there are eight things one can do to a square which transforms the square from being the square back to itself. Okay? The, the, the first thing is we could do nothing. It's pretty boring, but we could start with that. Or we could rotate by 90 degrees, and we'd still get back the square. Or rotate by 180 degrees. Or we could rotate by 270 degrees. Okay, so that's four so far. Or we could take the mirror image in the vertical axis and flip it over. We'd get back the square. Or we could consider the horizontal axis and flip it over and we'd get back the square. Or in each of the two diagonal axes, we could flip it over. So that's eight transformations in total. And in fact, we can combine these different transformations so, for example, we could rotate by 90 degrees and then flip the square, and you'd still end up back with the square unchanged. And it turns out, to use some math jargon, this symmetry group of these eight transformations is part of what makes a square a square. But now if we look at the circle, there are actually an infinite number of things we could do to a circle. We could rotate by 42 degrees, by 5 degrees, by any number of degrees. We could flip it in any number of axes. So an infinite number of things we could do to a circle. But where did this concept of a group come from? Well, actually, initially, one of the first people to consider the idea of a group was a man called Everest Galwa in the early 19th century. Now, Galwa was interested in studying the solutions of polynomial equations. So many of you will be familiar that if you take a quadratic equation, the top line of this slide, then to solve it, one ends up with this thing called the quadratic formula, 
the second line of this slide. And it turns out, although this is potentially less familiar, that there exists a cubic formula and a quartic formula for solving degree three and degree four uh, polynomial equations. But what about degree five? Is there a quintic formula? So the, the final equation on this slide. Well, it turns out there is no such general formula. And the reason is due to some deep properties relating to the symmetries of such equations. And I said earlier, a young man called Gawa. Why did I say that? Well, actually, Gawa got himself into a duel when he was 20 years old, possibly over uh, the rival attraction to some young lady. And he lost that duel. So he passed away, only 20 years old. But luckily for us, he managed to write down his results beforehand. And in fact, uh, he sent some letters telling his friends about this duel uh, just the night before he died. But let's go back to our circle and our square. What else is special about a circle and a square? Well, if you take the circle and imagine that we were to stand on top of the circle and zoom in very close up on top of the circle on the surface, it would seem like a line. And this idea of something locally looking like one-dimensional or two-dimensional or three-dimensional space or more dimensional space was developed in the mid 19th century by a man called Bernard Riemann. And Riemann observed that if you, uh, you could describe something called a Riemannian manifold, which describes things which locally look like one or two or three dimensional space. And he, we can consider this circle, the interior, locally looks like two dimensional space. Or we can consider this square, the interior, locally looks like two dimensional space. Or we can consider a sphere on the next slide. And on the sphere, the ball, as it were, you stand on top of it, locally, it looks like flat space. That's why when we stand on top of our planet Earth, locally, it looks like we are standing on top of uh, flat space. We don't see this curvature from standing on top. But now let's think about the applications of these ideas. So in the mid, uh, early 20th century, a lady, because it's not just men who come up with these ideas, a lady called Emmy Noether realized that there was an important connection between the symmetries of a physical system and conserved quantities. So in other words, if you have a symmetry of a system arising in physics, that symmetry would lead to a conserved quantity in the physical system. Later, a man called uh, Hermann Weyl and Eugene Wigner, in the, uh, also in the 20th century, realized that one could apply these ideas to the symmetries found in the equations and the systems themselves in quantum mechanics. And they realized that uh, you, Wigner in particular realized that you could apply these ideas to understand better the properties of atomic nuclei and of elementary particles. And for that, he received the 1963 Nobel Prize for Physics. But then going back to this idea of a manifold, Albert Einstein, in the early 20th century, a man some of you may have heard of, he realized that one could take the ideas of Riemann and apply this to how our universe looks like. And he saw that locally, our universe looks like the three-dimensional space we experience with a time dimension as well. But really, there is a curvature 
in space. And this curvature in space is what causes this gravity that we experience. And this is Einstein's theory of general relativity. But what about today? Well, many mathematicians are still working on developing new and exciting concepts like groups or proving properties about them, new facts about these things, or they are solving problems involving these things. And to take a recent example, Gregory Perlman proved that everything which seems like the three-dimensional equivalent of a sphere is really the three-dimensional equivalent of a sphere. And for that, he was offered one million US dollars by the Clay Mathematics Institute in 2010, which he declined. So maybe one of you, someday, will prove something important in mathematics and will be offered one million US dollars for your work, and maybe you will accept. Thank you. Goodbye.